Good afternoon. Welcome to NFFF Connect. This program is offered by the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation on the fourth Thursday of each month. Just a reminder to everyone, have your videos turned off and also your um, audio function muted. If you have a question for uh, Chief McLaughlin, uh, use the chat function. So I'd like to introduce today uh, Deputy Chief Retired Jim McLaughlin. Jim McLaughlin has been in the fire service since 1981. He started as a volunteer firefighter. He also worked in a combination department and a career department. He served in many roles from probationary firefighter to deputy chief of operations. Jim is currently the emergency management director as well as fire and EMS administrator in Coventry, Connecticut. Jim was instrumental in starting the Hartford Fire Department Honor Guard the Connecticut Statewide Honor Guard, and the National Honor Guard Commanders Association. He assisted with the Honor Guard element of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation annual memorial service for 15 years. He was the deputy chief in charge of the residential structure fire that claimed the life of firefighter Kevin Bell on October 7th, 2014. On that day, the Hartford Fire Department was dispatched to a residential structure fire at 630 PM. Within two minutes, the first arriving engine company reported a working fire in a two-story wood frame residence with fire showing from the BC corner. Companies have predetermined assignments based on first, second, third due engine companies and first and second due ladder companies. What appeared to be a one-room job turned into a fatal fire with other firefighter injuries. Chief, tell us about Firefighter Bell. Who was he? What do you want people to know about him? Um, so I just wanted to preface my comments and my statements uh, that the things that I say are things that I uh, recall to the best of my memory. Um, some may be my opinion. And um, my focus really on, on today is to discuss my uh, the impact as an incident commander that the line of duty death had on me. Um, Firefighter Bell was on the job at the age of 42. At the time of his death, he was a member of the department for six years. Um, I know that uh, he was married, had a daughter. Uh, he was a DJ on the side, and uh, uh, you know, family man. Um, uh, Honestly, I didn't really know him all that well. Uh, the The day of the fire was my third shift as a newly promoted deputy chief. And while I made it a point to get around to all the firehouses and, and get to know all of the members of the crew, uh, I had not had an opportunity to meet with this particular crew yet uh, prior to the time of the fire. And so uh, all I really knew about him was um, what I've heard about him from other people, what his reputation was, um, but I didn't really know him personally. That's, that's what I know about Kevin. The day of the fire um, was a day much like today. It was a blue sky day. It was um, a, a good weather day. It's uh, sunny and clear. We had a working fire in the morning. Uh, as a deputy chief, we would make the rounds to the different fire stations, collect paperwork, distribute paperwork. Um, and so after the, the first fire in the morning, the rounds to the fire stations, and it was a relatively routine day. Um, and went on a couple of calls throughout the day, some smells and bells. And um, by about six o'clock, 6.15 or so, the, uh, the, the dinner bell hit and I was working in a company that housed a engine company, um, a ladder company and the district chief and his aide. So there were 10 of us sitting around the dinner table uh, about the time that the, the dispatch came in. Um, as the incident was unfolding, 
folding. Um, well, I'll back up a little bit and just start at the time of dispatch. Uh, our normal um, assignment for a residential structure fire uh, upon initial dispatch is three engines, the rescue, two ladders, and a deputy chief. And um, so that's that was put out uh, for this call. I took a few uh, I took a few extra bites of my dinner, hopped in the car, and started to make my way to to the incident. While I was en route, uh, I was lis listening to the radio. We heard the first new engine company declare a working fire uh, at that time. So we operate on two different channels. The uh, the incident channel is uh, specifically for that incident. The dispatch channel manages the uh, activity of um, resources being dispatched to that incident, as well as dispatching other incidents citywide. And so uh, as monitoring both both channels and the first arriving engine company was about uh, two or three houses down um, from the incident address. So as soon as they pulled out of the garage and uh, they could see and smell the smoke and uh, wrapped a hydrant and pulled up to the front of the building and declared a working fire. Uh, at that time, as the responding deputy, I asked for a fourth and fifth engine and a second deputy. Uh, that gives us about 36 firefighters to manage the incident. Uh, as was mentioned in the intro, each each one of the companies has a pre, uh, pre-scripted assignment. You know, first engine would go to the, the fire, second engine would go uh, back up. Uh, third engine would establish a water source and uh, take a third line as directed. Uh, typically the floor above, unless things get changed around. Uh, first two ladder company would also uh, team up with the first two engine and initiate search and rescue. Along with the rescue company, second two truck would go to the roof. And so all of these things are kind of in place for us as a department um, to begin to take action, whether or not the, uh, the deputy chief is there. And so that's what happened here. Um, so there are several things that were going on prior to my arrival. The, um, the deployment of a first due hand line went in the A side of the building. Up the, uh, if you're looking at the pictures, up the left hand doorway, went up the stairs. And uh, the first engine and ladder were met with a, a doorway that had no handle on it. Uh, they were trying to force entry into that apartment or the second floor. Um, and so that kind of delayed their entry into the second floor for a little bit. The, um, the second due truck company uh, reported they had access through a stairwell on the D side of the building. And so uh, the second due engine was then relocated to pair up with the second due ladder company as they had access. Um, Things got progressively worse as the scene was going on. When I arrived, I put on my gear. I did a 360 of the building. I started to evaluate the radio reports that were coming to me from the companies that were inside. And I was comparing those reports to what I was seeing physically. Um, the second due officer or deputy chief that arrived took on the role of the safety officer. He geared up, he did his own 360, and we began to set up in the street with a, a mobile command post, as is depicted here, uh, where we would manage the resources with the uh, deputy chief's aid and, um, and just keep track of who's where and what floor and what their assignment is. Um, as I had mentioned, that things got progressively worse. Um, if you notice here on the second floor, uh, right hand side of the picture, there's um, a double casement window. There's two of them side by side. The left-hand side is where the smoke was coming out. We had a firefighter make that window um, and reach the, um, reach the windowsill and pass out and fell to the ground. Um, that was uh, something that I was looking at as the incident was progressing and trying to make communication between the street and the inside crews um, one, one thing that I noticed was that there was not a lot of responses. So I would ask engine 16 for a report, got no response. Mask ladder four for a report, got no response. 
Uh, you know, couple that with the fact that a firefighter bailed out of a window. We ordered an evacuation of the building and uh, a PAR check. And so at that point, uh, we made sure that everybody was out of the building. And upon completing the PAR check, it came that two of our members were missing. So we began the process of searching for two of the members. Uh, one of them was sitting in a rehab bus and uh, before the second one was Firefighter Bell. And so uh, Firefighter Bell the, uh, was reported to be missing, uh, made face-to-face -face contact with the Lieutenant from the engine company and uh, asked for his last known location, which he indicated was the second floor right-hand side of the building. And so I made face-to-face uh, -face contact with the, um, the RIT team lieutenant and added two members of the rescue team. So we had a RIT team going into the building with a hose line comprised of six people uh, as the fire still had not been hit and was still burning out of control. Um, so the RIT team went up and in very short order, we that they had him and that uh, he was tangled up in some furniture and that they would beat him down shortly. So uh, within a short period of time, they came down the stairwell and um, they brought uh, Firefighter Bell out into the front yard. And he was, uh, if you look at this picture here, you can see where the hose line goes into this uh, broad iron uh, uh, coffee table. And uh, so that's where the RIT team had uh, found him. Uh, also, the one thing to take note of is the, um, you know, it's just the conditions of the room. You know, some smoke damage, some heat damage. Um, the, obviously, the, the fire was in the, the rear BC corner. So if you went through that open um, doorway, the, the fire room was to the left of that. And the window that the firefighter built was uh, almost right where the person who took the picture was standing. So I think the next picture would show uh, when they brought uh, him out and the word started to get around. Um, these are our guys after a fire, which is very uncharacteristic of them kind of just standing there and looking like deer in the headlights. You know, after a, a structure, there would be one or two room job. You know, we're packing hose, we're, you know, patting each other on the back and you know, this was an uncharacteristic um, um, uh, photo op of, of how our guys are. Uh, this photo here depicts uh, what you can't see is firefighter Kevin Bell is in the middle of uh, the circle of firefighters uh, looking down and he was fully encapsulated in all of his PPE, including his SCBA. He had a completely empty bottle and um, it, everything was buttoned up you know the uh, the chin strap was was uh, buckled up the ear flaps were down the the, the collar was was velcroed closed and um it's just out of air and, and so we started to disrobe him uh had ems on the way and you know this is what his ppe looked like you know after the fat and so you know not a lot of thermal damage um not a lot of uh, smoke damage really um, you know, so begs a question as to, you know, what happened and why this is the gear here belonging to, uh, the guy that bailed out of the window. Uh, again, same scenario, not a lot of thermal damage to, um, to the gear and, um, but conditions were such that, you know, he had to bail out of the second floor and, uh, to the ground. He was transported to the local burn unit, um, and was there, um, I want to say about three weeks or so. And so those are the kinds of things are, uh, that, that kind of describe the incident uh, as, as best I can. And there was um, some tactical decisions that were, that were made. There were some behavioral issues that were, um, uh, you know, responsive to the activities of, of the firefighters that were in suppression mode. Um, but again, it was uh, on arrival. It looked like a two-story wood frame residential structure with fire in a BC bedroom. And, you know, we'll be out of here in 28 minutes and go home and eat meatballs. 
and nothing could have been further from the truth. So, you know, it was just uh, what seemed to be a bread and butter routine fire turned into, you know, a line of duty death of one of our own. Chief, tell us what you experienced in the aftermath of the incident. Uh, well, s starting on the street, standing outside of the, the building, I was approached by the police chief and he had indicated uh, that firefighter Bell had been transported to the hospital and uh, pronounced dead. And so that was a completely numbing feeling of, uh, uh, I want to say, stress, disbelief, denial. Uh, hard to understand, hard to believe that that, that could have and did actually happen. And um, from that point, the crews were directed to the training academy for a, a post-incident uh, review, uh, coupled with a visit from our um, EAP provider. Uh, and that didn't really go as well as we thought. The uh, EAP provider uh, essentially payment phone number on the white right board and said, you know, Unfortunately, these things happen when I go on vacation, but if you need to call my office, here's how to get a hold of me. Now, who wants to talk? So it, it was, it was, uh, I'm, I'm no pro at this stuff, but it was no way to handle, you know, um, a handful of guys that were just dealing with the death of one of their own and the whole disbelief factor. But we were able to kind of get through it a little bit. And a few people were able to talk and, and, um, and lead the way in the discussion. Um, and then we were kind of left there for a little while, not knowing what to do, if we were, should be, what we should be doing. And uh, eventually uh, we were told, uh, I believe it was the assistant fire chief at the time, uh, came down to the training academy and said that we were all relieved of duty for the night. And uh, we were free to go home, that they were going to backfill all of the, the positions with uh, overtime personnel. And so I, I had a hard time just packing up my stuff and going home. And I wound up um, going back to the incident address. I was met by the uh, local and state police, the fire marshal. And uh, they said, you know, at some point we're going to want your statement. And I said, well, there's no time like now. And so I wound up going through the entire incident in three different times with one of the state troopers and, and provided uh, my recollection as best I could, uh, both from memory and also walking around the address uh, with him and uh, came up with my statement and submitted that. And I think it was about five or six o'clock in the morning, I finally went home and, and uh, went to bed, so I kind of passed out. Um, that led to um, three months of, of difficulty in sleeping, second guessing myself, um, doubting myself, feeling guilty, you know, as the incident commander, I know that I'm ulti ultimately responsible for the lives of the men and women under com my command at every call we go on. And to come home with one less member than you responded with is just uh, difficult to describe that gut-wrenching uh, feeling of responsibility and failure. And uh, those are the kinds of things that went through through my head. I immediately stopped all extracurricular activities that I was engaged in. I was a, a firefighter in the city. I was a fire instructor at the state academy. I was doing fire service instruction for the last teams for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Mm -hmm. I was making my way around the country teaching for the National Honor Guard Academy. And all of that just came to a stop. And I would go to work for 24 hours. I would go home for three days. And I'd crawl into bed and I would eat on occasion. And, you know, that fourth day, that day I was supposed to be on duty, that was a day I looked forward to. That was the, um, that was the, the normal thing in my life that was going on. It was that I had uh, structure. I had a, a 
something to do. You get to work at seven o'clock. You talk to the outgoing deputy. You start working on the, the, the roster and the accountability for the day. And, um, start getting the count for the day and then have a coffee and some breakfast and then go do the rounds. You know, that was a typical beginning of a day for in the life of a deputy chief. And so that was one of the things that kind of kept me going. And I got a call one uh, evening from the, the fire chief. He said, listen, you, you don't have to come into work tomorrow. You know, take all the time you need. And I said, you know, is that a is that an order or a suggestion? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, this is the one thing that provides me, you know, structure and meaning in my, my, my day. I'm divorced. My kids are adults. I live in a house by myself. So, you know, to sit around all the time and just stare at four walls with nothing to do, um, drive me insane. You know, so like the, the takeaway that, that I have um, in, in retrospect is, you know, if, if you're a chief of a department or you're in, uh, you're in a position where you can tell people to stay home or suggest that they stay home, my, my suggestion is to ask them, you know. Um, some other things happened uh, later on, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But um, I would begin to like relive moment by moment the, uh, the timeline of the incident. And, you know, should I have done this? Should I have done that? Um, you know, if if I if I knew now some of the techniques of modern fire behavior and uh, the a course that I took after the line of duty fire through uh, UL, you know, uh, would the would the tactics have changed a little bit instead of trying to wait until we get an interior um, uh, attack going? Would we could we should we have hit the all visible fire from the exterior first? You know, and that's a Monday morning quarterback kind of thing. I always hate that. I still hate it. You know, I mean, you have to make a decision with the training that you have, the knowledge you have at the decision at the time that you have, uh, and you make that decision and you stick with it. And so, you know, again, in retrospect, I think that maybe there are some um, suppression tactics that could have been done differently that might have had a different outcome. Um, as I mentioned, I had quit teaching for the academy. I quit volunteering my time for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. I gave up my position as the statewide honor guard commander in the state of Connecticut. I gave up my position as the founding member of the National Honor Guard Commanders Association. I said, you all have to do this without me. I'm just, uh, I've, I've got to focus on me right now. And, um, you know, uh, again, part of that healing process was going to the, the, the funeral service and I think knowing what I know from my background in honor guard stuff, uh, that may have done more damage than good, um, only because uh, I just felt excluded from the entire process. And having the honor guard uh, available to me has always been a coping mechanism to deal with the sudden tragic loss of a firefighter. So that coping mechanism um, was stripped from me by a direct order from the fire chief to stand down and not offer any suggestions and not be involved whatsoever in the line of duty death services, even though that that was an area that I had a level of expertise in. And, um, that was difficult. Some of the positives were I began to get phone calls from all over the nation uh, from people that I had taught in the National Honor Guard Academy, from people that I had worked with side by side through the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. And these were calls of support. You know, and uh, that that was um, that was important for me in the healing process to know that I did have some support, because quite honestly, I felt uh, I felt like the department's administration and the the union in this particular case just turned it back on me and offered me up as a sacrificial lamb to take the hit for killing this kid. Uh, I was eventually um, sued by the family for the wrongful death of their loved one. And, um, you know, I know that there are a lot of factors that went into the, uh, the determination of his, his cause of death and what had happened at the incident. There were issues with the radio system. There were incidents, there were issues with the air pack. There were issues, issues with some of the decisions made at the command and control level. You know, all of that's outlined in, in the NIOSH report. And there are things that are not 
outlined in the NIOSH report that uh, quite frankly probably should have been. And that is uh, for the purposes of us as firefighters trying to learn from every aspect of what goes on at a fatal fire. How do we best learn from that is to study what actually went on so that we don't repeat those types of things. Um, so the first three months were very difficult. You know, I was dealing with unsubstantiated rumors and claims, um, you know, some of which wound up being true, some of which did not wind up being true. Um, you know, but after the first three months, I, I sought out uh, external help and went to a place called Onsite Academy up in uh, Massachusetts. And it was a five day inpatient treatment facility for post traumatic stress. And uh, that was one of the turning points in my recovery from dealing with the feelings of guilt and the doubt and second guessing myself. That was really helpful. And uh, I was able to process uh, through a um, treatment modality known as EMDR. It's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing for anybody that hasn't been through it. It basically takes the, the traumatic memories and unlocks them from one part of the brain and allows them to fall into the normal storage part of the brain. And that was, that was really a, a turning point for me to be able to feel a little bit normal uh, after something so abnormal happening. And so uh, the other thing I did while I was there was I realized that everything in my life was fire, fire, fire. My career was fire. My part-time job was fire academy. My passion was uh, fire service related honor guard activities. And I didn't have any balance really in my life. So uh, hence the, the reason I stopped doing all of the things that I was doing fire service related. I went out and bought a, um, a motorcycle and a piano. And I just started to immerse myself in writing and learning to play some tunes that I've never played before. And so till this day, I still do both of those activities. And it's a healthy thing for me to do to uh, enter some balance um, into my life. Sometimes I'll get on the bike and just go out of the driveway, take a left and wherever I wind up, I wind up. Um, so, you know, the first three months were difficult. The, the, from three months to about a year and a half, uh, you know, there were a couple of anniversaries, there were memorial services, there were funeral services. You know, I traveled to Colorado Springs uh, on my own time and dime to attend the IAFF memorial service. I went to the National Fallen Firefighters uh, annual memorial service. Uh, I went to the Connecticut Firefighters Memorial Service. Uh, there was a couple of um, memorials held by the Hartford Fire Department, and I, I attended those as well. But, you know, I, I after my time up at the on-site academy, it was recommended maybe I should pair up with a therapist and just to uh, talk with them about ongoing care and uh, self-care and how am I going to process things going forward. And so I did begin that um, at, at some point. I don't know exactly when. And uh, I'll tell you that it's been eight years. I still see a guy two times a month. Sometimes I need it, sometimes I don't, but I never know which times I'm going to need them and which times I'm going to, I won't. So I maintain that, um, that uh, ongoing care, you know, and I just do it for myself. And uh, I think it's important. There's other things that come up in my life that I can talk to my therapist about. And sometimes it has to do with uh, what goes on um, in my daily life. Sometimes it has, is directly related you know, the death of Kevin Bell, you know, the uh, anniversaries are really hard for me. When a firefighter dies in the line of duty, that's hard for me. Um, uh, within the last year, uh, we had two firefighters in the city of New Haven die. And when I started to look at some of the details of that event, they were like so closely related to the event that I experienced that, um, uh, it, I just felt compelled to go and offer my experience to the incident commanders that were um, dealing with their incident. And um, they found it to be helpful. I found it to be helpful. And it's the beginning of a new relationship for me to be able to uh, network with other peers. Um, another thing that I did um, within the first year was I started to reach out uh, to, um, to some other fire chiefs who had been incident commanders of a line of duty death fire. 
uh, with the assistance of, of the union, uh, I was able to get put in touch with Mike McNamee from Worcester, who was the incident commander in 1999. Joe Finn, who was the incident commander in, in Boston on the Charles River fire where two guys died in a basement. And I made some contacts with Chris Martin in Bridgeport and Ron Mullins from Brantford, um, uh, Jimmy Shea in Windsor. Um, so all of these folks had been uh, incident commanders of a line of duty death. And um, um, one of the things that I recognized was that peer level support was so critical to me being able to identify with people that I'm talking with and be able to be transparent with them. And uh, I, I kind of had a foundation through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been sober 33 plus years. And I knew the benefits of a peer support program through that and uh, just a, felt as though the application of that program to being able to deal with uh, or talk with other incident commanders of a fatal fire was that they truly understand what I'm going through. While the details might be somewhat different, they've been there, they've done that, they know what it feels like. In some cases they've had support, in some cases they haven't, um, but it was, a, it was a beginning point to establish relationships with people that kind of um, got what I was going through. And I felt that that was important to be able to uh, have those discussions and share my feelings and what I was going through. Um, you know, and then I began the process of trying to put together uh, something like a peer support program that currently exists now with the, uh, the foundation. And, uh, you know, I think that the, uh, the foundation's programs are just a phenomenal asset. I'll do a little plug here for them, but between the um, the incident commander cohort that's been recently developed and the chief to chief program, and uh, my my experience with the honor guard has put me in touch with fire service survivors and their families, and um, so I'm familiar with the the programs that are available for you know the fire departments, the fire chiefs, the surviving spouses, the family members, the parents, the children. You know, there, there just seemed to be a piece that was missing, and that was for the incident commander that was ultimately responsible for the lives of the men and women under their control. Um, and I, I thank the the foundation for taking that on as a uh, as a, a place by which other incident commanders can now uh, get help. And I'm uh, uh, a member of that cohort, and I try to get myself engaged with those folks um, whenever I can. The other, you know, things that they offer, like the last program, which will help any department in, in a line of duty with what to do from the time of death until the time of burial. And then after support, the uh, taking care of our own program, the everyone goes home program and uh, all of the uniform support groups and programs that they offer are just, uh, uh, you know, to me, they're a blessing and they're, they're a help when it comes to, you know, I've experienced this issue now. What do I do? Where do I get help? So uh, long term, you know, say beyond the, the 18 month period of, of the interviews and the investigations, you know, I went through a number of investigations. The department had an internal board of inquiry report that was done. Um, NIOSH and OSHA did an investigation. The Connecticut State Police did an investigation. You know, uh, Every newspaper reporter did their own investigation. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry had their own rendition of what happened. And, uh, you know, so social media and mainstream media, um, official uh, official reports and investigations was, was a little overwhelming. I think one of the, the most poignant parts of the investigative process was when NIOSH was in the house and went through the entire investigation and asked at the very end, did I have any questions? And I only had one. And that was, did anybody here on the investigation team ever uh, serve as an incident commander at a line of duty death fire? And the answer was no. And so I just ask that they take that into consideration when they're uh, doing their evaluation and I turned around and walked out. But, uh, you know, I felt like I was the bad guy just from, from day one. And, you know, maybe that was my own interpretation. Um, 
you know, but there were some things that went on that really uh, gave me bona fide reason to feel that way. And um, so that was in 2014. I retired in 2017. Um, I w will not blame it on the, the line of duty death of, of Kevin Bell. There were some other decisions that were made that had to do with uh, um, the benefits that were going to impact my family. That was the ultimate reason why I left. But I didn't. I wasn't ready to leave. You know, I had 23 years. Uh, I, I had a 25-year plan, and that was to maximize my pension. But I wound up leaving 23, and I got a. Uh, I didn't max my pension unfortunately, but I was able to keep my insurance and it was a decision I made and I don't regret. Um, so with respect to um, kind of long-term recovery, uh, one of the things that I do is maintain my, uh, my appointments with my therapist. I do things like take motorcycle rides and travel without a plan and, um, and just try to lead a more balanced life than I did uh, previously. So that's a little bit about the incident, what I experienced, and and a lot of the the aftermath. Thank you, Chief. It was a powerful story. Talked about the the connections that that helped you regain your confidence. Oh, tell us about um, the agency. What changes were implemented in the fire department after the tragedy? Um. There were a lot of things that went on administratively, um, such as policy uh, reviews. We call them department directives, but uh, a lot of department directors were pulled out, uh, specifically ones that had a direct impact on on the the outcome. You know, related to uh, what does each company do um, when they arrive at a fire? Um, what are what? How do we communicate? You know, what are our communication methods and means? Uh, the, the radio system that we used at the time was, uh, um, I would say, antiquated at best. It, it was uh, um, maybe first generation, 800 megahertz trunked technology. And, uh, you know, one of the significant um, elements uh, that contributed to the, the fire was the fact that the company officer, uh, he owed a mayday call that was never heard by any of the um, members of the department on the fire ground. Uh, so from the incident commander to the incident commander's aide, the safety officer, the safety officer's aide, and the uh, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine other company officers that had uh, ear mic to their ear, nobody heard a, um, a mayday. Uh, you know, however, when it was recorded at the dispatch center, you know, it was faint, but it was there, you know. And so uh, one of the changes is that the department evaluated the, the state of their communications equipment and the, the, the backbone and the infrastructure. And um, by the time I left in 2017, the, uh, the same communications equipment was still being used. And uh, my connections to members of the department is is limited, really. And so um, I'm not 100% sure, but I do believe that they have recently, uh, or within the last two years, have changed over to a new system. But I don't I don't know that for sure. Um, I do know that department directives were pulled and looked at and reviewed and rewritten. Um, but there was a, a pretty solid disconnect. Uh, between myself and the administration, um, you know, when it came to the um, the line of duty death uh, and the orders to stand down with respect to any type of honor guard involvement, there was not a lot of communication between uh, the administration and me personally. Um, you know, so the only thing that I saw were um, maybe directives that would come out of the chief's office to the department as a whole saying, you know, update policy one to policy 1A. So I, I don't know a lot about um, the changes uh, other than, you know, thing, a lot of things were under review, not a lot changed in the, the three years from the time of the actual fire until I left. Well, Chief, it's been just over eight years since this incident, what, what do you want today's firefighters to know about the incident? 
Uh, well, uh, the first one that, that I mentioned a little bit earlier was that in this particular case, um, and of course I'm playing Monday morning quarterback, but uh, if an ex exterior attack was initiated prior to any personnel going into the structure, that may have darkened down the fire uh, and changed conditions enough to have had a different outcome. I can't say that with certainty. I can only go theoretically based on the training that I've received. It sounds like mm, that might have made sense, but I was taught differently, you know, and for, for 30 years I, I had practiced, you know, we go inside a building, we find the seat of the fire and we, we knock it down from the inside out. And so that's one of the things that we did. And, uh, you know, so I just implemented the training and the uh, experience that I had. But I think that, you know, this concept of modern fire tactics, if it were in, in implemented, may have had a different result. So I'd say stay on top of training and, and stay on top of, uh, you know, the most, uh, most current training uh, elements that are coming out. Uh, another one would be is to don't um, don't take things for granted and don't be complacent that when the bell hits, you need to be on high alert. You know, even if it's a, you know, a, a routine place, you know, you go to on a regular basis uh, over and over and over. You got to be ready for things to be different when you get there this time. Um, I think it's important for people to know that there's always more to the story. You know, if you look at the picture now being displayed, um, I was um, part of the National Fallen Firefighters uh, Honor Guard element, and I had the honor to be able to uh, ring the ceremonial bell at the 2015 memorial service where Kevin was honored. His family was there, department members were there. Uh, a lot of my uh, colleagues and uh, folks on a national basis were there. and that was a really difficult thing for me to do. You know, I had tried to engage uh, the family in some discussion, you know, and offer my condolences. And they were very distant. Um, this was October, 2015, this was a year after the fire. What I didn't realize was in, uh, within the month after this picture was taken, I was served with wrongful death papers. I was sued for the wrongful death of Kevin Bell. And it made sense then that the family was not going to be engaging in um, harmonious conversations with the guy that killed their loved one. Um, difficult to accept. You know, when I taught at the Honor Guard Academy, it was one of the things I taught. Like, oh, you know, the family is going to get mad at you and the department for killing their loved one. And, you know, you should expect that. So from an a intellectual standpoint, I can, I can accept that from an emotional standpoint, that was very difficult for me. Um, I think that individual decisions have group consequences and that there were individual decisions that were made uh, by individuals at the fire that had consequences that affected a lot of people. And, uh, I think it's just important to always make sure that you represent not only yourself, you represent your department, you re represent the municipality that you work for, and you represent the fire service as a whole. So when one of us messes up, it's a reflection on all of us. And we can always say, you know, that was just uh, an isolated incident, but it, it, it has an impact on the fire service as a whole. Um, you know, when I was preparing for this, I started to look at some of the paperwork and the reports that I had. And, you know, I, I balanced between wanting to revisit each and every detail versus wanting to put it away and wish it never had happened. You know, obviously I chose to revisit the details, but they opened up a lot of emotions of past pain and hurt. And I'll be honest and say, it's not a nice feeling. And from a selfish perspective, I'm hoping that there's more healing that comes from this process. You know, it's one of the things, uh, or one of the reasons why uh, when asked to share a little bit about what I went through and how it impacted me, that I thought that it would be a good idea. Um, you know, it's, 
it's not to point blame or downplay the importance of any one element, but in the totality of uh, the entire line of duty death experience, I think it's important to be able to share uh, what worked, what didn't work um, with other people that are going through it or have gone through it um, so that you th then develop this level of support that you didn't have before. Um, so I, I'm hoping that some of those things will help people that, uh, you know, ultimately go through something like this will, will be a, a good takeaway to be able to, to some of the, uh, the support that's out there. Most definitely. Along that line, Chief, what, what advice in summary would you give to other incident commanders that may have to deal with the loss of one of their own? Well, number one, take care of yourself. You know, so get as best you can, try to get a good night's sleep, try to eat right. And if you have to force a level of structure into your daily life, I think it's important to have that. You know, if you, uh, if you work out, work out. If you go for walks, go for walks. Uh, the mistake I made was I quit everything. And for three months, I worked for a day and I climbed into bed for three. And I worked for a day and I climbed into bed for three. So you know, try to maintain some level of structure in your life and take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Seek out others that um, of the same rank or function. You know, I happen to be a deputy at uh, the line of duty death fire that I was in charge of. But there are other people that are incident commanding your firefighters, lieutenants, captains, deputies, battalions, assistant chiefs and chiefs. You know, so it's, I think it's important more to reach out to somebody that's experienced what you experienced at the function for which you were um, in charge of or responsible for at the time of the event. That really brings this level of true peer-to-peer -peer connection that for me was important in the healing process. Uh, the other thing was to look out for each other. You know, when I got back in a saddle and started to make the rounds. One of the things that I heard from many of the guys that are riding the fire truck was, you know, we, um, we have our confidence in you. We want you to know that when the bell hits and that the next work and fire, we've got every ounce of confidence in you as our, as our deputy. And we don't want you ever to think otherwise. Um, you know, and then develop re relationships with the crews that you have now. Uh, I didn't have an opportunity uh, to develop a relationship with, with uh, the guys that were assigned to that, uh, that crew that day uh, in capacity that I was assigned as their deputy chief. Um, but, you know, the time was against me in that regard. You know, I had, uh, like I said, I was in my third shift as a deputy and uh just hadn't made it to every firehouse to sit down and have a cup of coffee and really get to know people. So, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your family, look out for each other in a firehouse and uh, to maintain some level of uh, structure in your life. Chief, is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I know every line of duty death is different. Um, but there are some common elements too, such as the uh, the loss of life, the uh, the fact that we put our lives on the line and we accept that risk when we when we get hired and we we accept the badge. We know that there's a risk that's involved in in what we do. Um, uh, some seem to be straightforward, plain and simple, and and easily explained. Other line of duties are more complex. Um, you know, in, in my case, it wasn't just the line of duty death, but it was, you know, a, a feeling of administrative abandonment and just being out there alone. Uh, while I did have out, outside support uh, from my own network of, of people, uh, I didn't feel um, I didn't feel it from the city or the department. Uh, and that was disappointing, really, because. You know, as I say, you can love the job, but the job will never love you back. And, um, you know, the um, the investigations, I, I think that that's, um, I, I don't think any level of training can prepare you for, you know, being grilled 
open and, and um, investigated to the level at which, um, you know, this, this type of event requires, you know, and uh, nobody prepares you for that. And um, the other thing too, is like uh, triggers, you know, anniversary triggers, uh, the line of duty triggers, you know, there's a lot of things that come pop up out of the blue and uh, all of a sudden it just brings back this rush of emotion of, you know, I went through this and it didn't feel good. And, you know, what do you do now to, to, to process that? And what do you do to deal with that? Um, and so the, the, I guess the, the, the message that I want to send out is there is help. There's other people out there that have gone through something similar to what you're going through in a line of duty death capacity, whether you're the chief of the department, you're the incident commander, a company officer, or a brother or sister firefighter. There's other people out there that have gone through this very unfortunate experience, but are willing to step up and share their, uh, their experience, their strength, uh, and their hope as to how they dealt with it and what worked for them to get through it. And, you know, if you can tap into a, a half a dozen people and get differences of uh, opinions and suggestions, it may help you to navigate your own path because each one is going to be individualized. So. Chief, thank you so much for sharing your powerful story. There's a couple of comments in the chat about uh, how so many more should uh, be watching this and I could not agree more. And just a reminder to everyone that this is recorded and will be posted with a link on the NFFF's website. So uh, please reach out to others in the fire service and let them know that that is how they can listen to Chief McLaughlin's very powerful story. A reminder to everybody also that due to the holidays, there will not be an NFFF Connect in November or December. So the next one will be January 26th, 2023 at one o'clock. So go ahead and put that on your calendars. Chief, thank you again so much for sharing your powerful story. And to everyone uh, who attended, thank you so much for attending and, and hearing this powerful story. Y'all have a wonderful day.